Good morning, friends. We are reading chapter eight of One False Note by Gordon Corman today. Three pairs of eyes focused on the tall, straight-backed Asian man hurrying across the street, tapping along with his diamond-tipped walking stick. Alistair O, oh, their Korean cousin, yet another competitor in the contest. So much for being ahead of the other team, Stan observed. He's probably not here for the clear mountain air, Nellie agreed. They watched as Uncle Alistair loped across the street and boarded a bus parked at the opposite curb. Follow him, Amy said suddenly. Let's see where he's going. Nellie made a highly illegal right turn from the left lane and fell into line behind the bus. She waved gaily at the Salzburg drivers who were cursing and honking. You know, mused Dan, if we want to find out where he's going, why can't we just ask the guy? Don't we have still have an alliance with him from Paris? Remember what Mr. McIntyre said, Amy countered. Trust no one. Maybe so, but Uncle Alistair sure saved our butts in the catacombs. Amy was unimpressed. Only because he had to help us to stop the cameras. If there's one thing we ought to know by now, it's that Cahills have been fighting each other for centuries. He'd do anything to distract us from the 39 clues. They followed the bus as it rattled over the Stratsbrook, the bridge at the center of town. Passengers got on, but no one got off. The streets were crowded with cars and taxis, and throngs of sightseers were everywhere. A high school group stepped out in front of the Fiat, and the bus roared around a corner and out of view. Don't lose them, Dan said urgently. At last the road cleared and the Fiat lurched off, Nellie shifting awkwardly. They jumped down a few narrow streets, but there was no sign of the bus. Amy pointed, there! The bus had left the grid of downtown streets and was roaring along the side of a hill. In a screech of gears, they set off in pursuit, picking up speed as the Fiat rounded the bend. They were so focused on the chase that they raced right past the stopped bus, which was disgaging passengers at an ancient stone gate. Amy peered at the collection of very old buildings topped with steeples and crosses. A church? Dan looked miserable. It's like Mozart wasn't boring enough. The last church we were in wasn't boring, Amy reminded him. We both nearly got killed. Nellie made a U-turn and pulled up a discreet distance behind the bus. St. Peter's Arch Abbey, she translated, squinting at the wrought iron sign. They could see Alistair's tall figure starting up the sloped path through the gate. Nellie frowned. Do you think your clue would be in there? Alistair thinks it is, Amy decided. We can't leave until we know one way or the other. Why don't you find a hotel and give Saladin a chance to recover from the trip? The au pair looked reluctant. Dan spoke up. The place is full of tourists. How dangerous can it be? All right, Nellie said finally. I'll be back here in an hour. Try not to get yourselves killed. She drove off. They entered through the gate and Amy chose an English brochure from the rack. Wow, she breathed. This place is more than 1,300 years old. The monastery was founded in 696. But they think the Romans were here even before that. Romans? Dan showed a stirring of interest. Those Roman legions had some super sweet fighting skills. That's why you find Roman artifacts all over Europe, Amy explained. Their armies were so powerful that they conquered most of the known world. Unstoppable, Dan agreed. He frowned. So why the church? That was built later in the 12th century, long after the Romans had gone. The oldest graves in the cemetery date back to around that time. Cemetery, Dan beamed. This place is starting to grow on me. They lay low until Uncle Alistair's tour group had filed into the main cathedral and then ducked through the arch that led to the graveyard. It was like no cemetery Dan had ever seen. Overgrown with brush, the markers barely visible through the foliage. Instead of tombstones, the plots were represented by wrought iron signposts with fancy old-fashioned script. Reminds me of Aunt Beatrice's silver souvenir spoon collection, Dan mumbled to Amy. Her nose was still immersed in the brochure. All at once, she grabbed his wrist and squeezed hard enough to splinter bone. Dan, it says the last remains of Nenero Mozart are right here. Dan's eyes widened. We're going to dig up a dead body? Awesome. Shh, of course not. But what if Mozart planted a clue on his sister? Amy shook her head. Mozart died before Nanero. Now we're looking for a communal tomb. That's where the guidebook says she's buried. What's that? Dan asked. Like, a condo for dead people? Show some respect. One of the others in her crypt is Michael Hayden, the famous composer, and one of Mozart's biggest supporters. He couldn't resist. What's he doing now? Decomposing? Don't be gross. Come on. It took a few minutes of wandering for them to find the mausoleum. Compared to some of the opulent and elaborate burial chambers at St. Peter's, it was a simple stone structure bearing the names of the dead with biblical passages engraved on the walls. There was no sign of anything that could be considered a clue. 
You're not forgotten, Anne Earl, Amy whispered somberly. People are starting to appreciate you as a genius in your own right. What's the big fascination with Anne Earl Mozart, Dan asked. So she was as good as her brother, so what? Don't you see how unfair that is? Amy demanded. She never got the credit just because she was a girl. I agree, said Dan. She got a raw deal, but now that she's been in the script for a couple hundred years, what difference does it make to her? It makes a difference to me, she argued. What if I were Mozart's siblings? How do you think I'd feel if you were considered this whiz kid prodigy and I was nobody when we were equally good at the same thing? Her brother was unperturbed. That could never happen to us. We're not good at any of the same things. Hey, what's that? He was peering quizzically out at the crypt entrance. The abbey abutted a sheer rock face. Fifty feet of ground, the rough outline of a building had been carved into the mountain. Who puts a house halfway up a cliff? Upon closer inspection, they found a crude staircase hewn directly into the stone, leading to the cave-like portal. Amy scoured the brochure. Here it is. That's the entrance to the Salzburg catacombs. Catacombs, Dan echoed in trepidation. They'd come very close to being lost forever in the catacombs of Harris. He wasn't anxious for a repeat performance. Well, not the paved with bone kinds, Amy explained, but it says here there are tunnels in that hill. If there's a clue at St. Peter's, I'll bet that's where it is. A tour group came into view, working its way to the entrance of the cliff. In the middle of the cluster was the tall figure of Alistair O. And the competition just pulled ahead of us, Dan added. As soon as Uncle Alistair's tour disappeared inside the rock face, the Cahills rushed up the uneven stone stairs. Amy felt a creepy unease as she stepped inside the mountain, as if they were being swallowed by something ancient and immutable, an immense, silent creature as old as the earth itself. Amy and Dan exchanged a look of pure dread. The Paris catacombs had been lined with human bones, grotesque skulls leering from all directions. This may have been lower on the ick scale, but the sense of leaving the familiar for the freakish and threatening was even greater here. The tunnel was clammy and easily twenty degrees colder than the outside. Dan reached down and felt the familiar shape of his inhaler. This had to be the worst spot on earth for his asthma to flare up. Chill out, he reminded himself. Attacks were brought on by extreme dust and pollen, not extreme creepiness. To their left was a small cave chapel straight out of the Flintstones. Uncle Alistair's group was crowded in there when the Cahills hurried by, covering their faces. The further they got from the entrance, the darker it became. The passage was lit only by a series of weak electric bulbs strung so far apart that everything faded to utter blackness in between them. As they forged ahead, another tour group was walking toward them in the tunnel. Pale, top-lit faces vanished into the gloom, only to reappear suddenly thirty feet closer. It was otherworldly, as if the laws of nature no longer applied in this alien place. "'Stay to the right,' the tour guide ordered, directing his sightseers around the Cahills in the close quarters. They were jostled by elbows and shoulders as the group shuffled past. Someone stepped on Amy's toe and she drew in a sharp breath. Or maybe her gasp was a reaction to the man she saw in the halo of the naked bulb. He was old, older than Uncle Alistair, probably in his late sixties, with weathered, cratered skin. His clothing was all black, so his head appeared to be suspended in mid-air. Amy's heart was thumping so hard she was afraid it might punch clear through her rib cage. She grasped her brother's hand and began towing him along the passage. Slow down, Dan complained. Amy didn't stop until she was positive the tour group was out of earshot. Dan, the m- the m- Even whispering, she could not control her stammer. Calm down, her brother soothed. The man in black is here. 